On today's episode of the New Statesman podcast, we're doing a year in review of British politics ahead of the new year. So you and I, Harry, we first started working together in, was it 2014? Summer of 2014? Yeah, a golden age. Um, so I was a staff writer on the web desk at the New Statesman, and you were running a special polling site, May 2015, which in my head is still like the election year. <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> and actually, to be honest, we wanted to go back a little bit before we go over the year that we've just had. We wanted to go back to those times because there's been a lot of things that have happened this year where we've turned to each other and been like, remember in 2015 when that happened? Because actually 2012, uh, so 10 years ago, is quite significant because it's the last time Labour were kind of seen as in the ascendancy, wasn't it? And you've been looking at some polling from back then. So maybe we should start then and draw yeah. some parallels with today. Yeah, so we, if you go back a decade... Ed Miliband has a narrow lead over David Cameron. Labour about five or six points ahead of the Tories. Now, of course, Labour are quite a bit more ahead today. But I think there are some real parallels. And if you think about Miliband and Cameron and then Keir and Rishi, I don't think their politics are that different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Keir's, if you actually look at the policy and everything else, I think Keir's very much in the in the Miliband mould and, and, uh, and Rishi, same as Cameron. But the question is then why... At the Labour Party 20 points ahead now. They were only five, six points ahead in 2012. And also, if you look back at 2012, there's some cautionary tales for Labour there because we got convinced in that sort of 2012 to 2014 period that Labour could get back in. Yeah, absolutely. I was at Labour Conference that year. I was working for Total Politics magazine back then, which is now defunct. I like to say since I left, it, yeah. it closed. But that was the year Interviewed of... Interviewed Kwasi Kwarteng, if I remember. I did, yeah, yeah. Back when he was... But a uh, mere backbencher. Look at him now. And he had a recording <laughs> of your conversation that he brandished right at the end of the interview, right? He, he did. He secretly recorded our interview. Yeah, that's the red flag right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always felt that he was quite a strange guy since then because he sort of stood up at the end of the interview, didn't shake my hand or look me in the eye, just pulled the stick phone out of his pocket and pressed stop. Right. I was like, okay, you are just a backbencher. <laughs> wow, well, did you know? Did you know. It was the year at Labour conference where it was Ed Miliband's One Nation speech. I don't know if you remember this, mm -hmm. but he sort of stole that language of Disraeli to try and park his tanks on the Tories' lawn and say the economy isn't working for everyone anymore. And it, it got some plaudits. You know, you can imagine the sort of geeky commentary at how much they enjoyed it. And it was also a year where they won the um, Corby by-election, which was painted at the time. And I've looked back at some old newspaper articles from that by-election as Labour having a resurgence in Middle England, because that was a Tory marginal seat, Louise Mench's seat, if any listeners remember Louise Mench. You know, I think Ed Miliband was gaining some traction that year. And like you say, they were ahead in the polls. And that party conference was quite triumphalist. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at the one that we were both at this, this year, year yeah. there was a feeling of triumph. I mean, I don't know if you were at that party at the end, the Mirror Party. People were chucking around copies of that day's Mirror, which had a front page sort of saying that Keir Starmer was poised to be the next prime minister. They were chucking it around this club, right. singing things can only get better. And I, even in that moment when I was trying to enjoy myself, I was like, this reminds me of party conferences past, particularly mm -hmm. that one. Well, unfortunately, I missed that party. Sounds like a, a blast. <laughs> but I think, you know, in pre preparation for this pod, I went and looked at all the data. Mm. And I don't think Labour are anything like 20 points ahead, having looked at it. Because I think Sunak and... Starmer are actually really quite similarly rated uh, and it is again like in 2012 Miliband had a very narrow lead over Cameron Starmer only has a very narrow lead as preferred prime minister yeah. over Sunak and just like uh, the other crucial issue is the economy back then um, you know the the Tories were going through a really tough economic time just like they are now George Osborne had a minus 30 point approval rating as chancellor yeah I remember how popular he was yeah. right exactly and and, you know, the Booed Tories at the Olympics that year. Completely. And then two years later, things have started to change. And it is, I think, salutary to, rem to remind listeners that Rich Sunak doesn't have to call an election until January 2025. So there is plenty of time for another narrative shift. And uh, I do think that that 2012 period kind of will, will ring out if, if that happens again. Yeah, absolutely. And those personal ratings and ratings on economic competence, those have decided, or well, not decided, but those whoever's been Crucial. ahead in yeah. those has won the most recent i think 10 elections and on the economic side now the well, data is of elections rather. i think that's absolutely right and yeah. on the economic data right now is very uh very close like reeves and, and starmer versus sunak and hunt it's pretty much level pegging mm -hmm. the big difference i guess is that the pendulum has swung in like a deeper sense so obviously in 2012 there'd only been two years of tory government and even though the cuts were deeply unpopular 
They were also deemed to be necessary and they were primarily blamed on the last Labour government. 12 years later, however many prime ministers we've since had, you know, it's all been Tory rule. So they can't, the blame is now squarely on the Tory camp. And I think that's why it probably is actually a different period. Yeah, I think so. And I think two other things have changed as well, which is that the cuts at the time, which were deemed uh, necessary, sort of there was kind of a bit of a media politics consensus there, which the public seemed to buy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they are now catching up with pretty much every level of society. So you see it most obviously in the NHS. So the middle classes who have sort of allowed a voice in politics and perhaps more influence in how our public services are run, they they have noticed the impact of the cuts now. So that's caught up with sort of, if you want, the mainstream kind of politically influential demographic. Um, because first of all, it was more on the shoulders of the people who were perhaps had, had less of a voice in society and were perhaps at the sharpest end. Completely. Second of all, I think you now have a shift in general, perhaps brought about by, by the pandemic, in how people view the economy. So people, according to polling on what people associate the economy with, is less to do with debt and deficit and more to do with the cost of living and you know how much money they have in their pockets. And that has actually shaped public opinion, not just of how public services should be funded. People want more funding for public services and higher taxes to do that, although that polling gets a little bit murkier when you ask sort of exactly who and what should be mm-hmm. taxed. Um, but you also have a complete change in opinion on um, welfare. And, you know, even sort of in the Tory think tanks, I was watching the event that the Centre for Policy Studies, a Tory think tank, did recently about welfare. And even there, they, you know, they were noticing in their research that people are in general for the first time for a long time are feeling that benefits are too low rather than too high so this is so this is the probably the most interesting thing i i remember studying in my politics and economics degree it's called the thermostatic effect Mm -hmm. which is that the public go in the opposite direction to whatever the government's doing yes so in 2012 they just hadn't had enough time to move away from the consensus that the conservative party were imposing on us but now you're talking about all of these things having shifted, like in the British social attitude survey, people exactly, want yeah. Yeah, more spending, not less. And that's the consequence of 12 years. I mean, the irony, of course, and we'll get onto it when we talk about this year, is that was what Boris Johnson was meant to do. He was meant to ride that, that alternative wave. He was meant to essentially be a sort of left-wing economic figure who was going to react to that, that changing public mood. But now we're back to to Rishi, who's kind of Cameron Light on the economy. Yeah, absolutely. That thermostatic effect is really interesting. I remember because with the British Social Attitude Survey, that was what first showed these shifting opinions about benefits. And I I interviewed John Curtis, who is involved in it, about it, the great pollster. And he was saying, actually, the last time we saw these kind of attitudes towards welfare was under Thatcher, Mm -hmm. which will have been, you know, that sort of right. opposite effect. You mean the end of Thatcher, presumably? Yeah, the end of Thatcher, Right, yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Anyways, so let's move on. You mentioned Boris Johnson. Actually, it was this time last year, I think, in the what they call the betwixtmas, I think, period. This new phrase that yeah. I have <laughs> that, barely ever heard. That you look disgusted by. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm on camera, so you can attest. <laughs> so it was this time last year, I think, that the Partygate stories were first starting to come out. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. if you go back, so it's just around December 1st, I think when the first one breaks in the mirror. And that's also the last time that the Tories and the Labour Party are tied in the polls. Yeah, yeah. And it's a very rare event in that within weeks, I mean, obviously within days, polls start to move, which is pretty rare. Polls don't move much. And then within weeks, Labour has a 10 point lead. Yeah. And and that becomes clear right at the start of this year, in early January, and then in um mid-January when the news of the party on the eve of Prince Philip's funeral, uh, it breaks. that, And that's the one that, as you started to talk to MPs around that time, they were like, that's the one my constituents remember. Yeah. And actually it was, yeah, it was that picture, wasn't it, of the Queen sitting alone at Prince Philip's funeral. That was run on those stories. And I think that definitely shifted people's opinions. And it's a remarkable, exactly. And you think about this whole year, I mean, what a year it's been, uh, obviously with the Queen's death as well. But I think, you know, just placing it in broader context, I would say this is the third big year in the past decade. So you had 2016, which is of course uh, uh, for Trump and Brexit and Corbyn surviving, you know, just extremely important year. And then 2019, you have all the chaos of that period, which essentially dragged me back into politics, by the way. I mean, like, I kind of... You're drawn to chaos. Yeah, I am. I like think. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just like the Theresa May years were so um, interminable. And then I remember it was like March 2019 when she was failing to get those votes through the Commons. Yeah. And the independent MPs essentially seized control of the timetable. 
And I was like, this is fantastic. This is how I think government should be run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> by the MPs, for yeah, the MPs. Yeah, exactly. So um, anyway, that, that 2019 is an amazing year and Cummings comes in and Johnson. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this is the third big year, you know, 2022. So I, th- I thought we could run over just some of the madness. Definitely. It's, it's starting in January. So this like this three-week period, if you remember. So as I say, it starts um, just around 12th to the 14th of January. That's when you get the... Uh, the first admittance by Johnson that he did attend this garden party mm-hmm. in May 2020. And he, he offers a heartfelt apology. And uh, Douglas Ross comes out and says he's got to go. And that, at the time, seemed like, you know, just uh, a lone voice in the wind. But over the next three weeks, 15 MPs call for him to go. And all sorts of things happen. I mean, uh, you have... On the 19th of January, just five days after the Prince Philip news, you have Christian Wakeford cross the floor. Yeah, I remember that. I was on Politics Live that day. Really? Yeah, yeah. And it happened during the programme. And they had poor Andrew Bowie, the Tory MP on, and he just did not know how to react to it. In fact, his reaction, I think his face absolutely fell on ca- on camera. And they put that reaction on the 10 o'clock news that evening because it was the first MP to rea- Tory MP to re- react in real time to that crossing of the floor. Well, that's really interesting you were with him because I remember being with him on the terrace later on and he said, um, you know, Wakeford, Wakeford essentially screwed the plan. <laughs> like you know, the the rebellion was was very much afoot. Yeah, and Wakeford crossing the floor delayed yeah, it because nothing makes a party unite more than a yeah than a turncoat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that was a big moment. I, I'd actually forgotten about Christian Wakeford then, but um, well, obviously the significance of that went deeper than just the potential rebellion against Boris Johnson because he was an MP, a Tory MP for a so-called red wall seat, Bury South. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was supposed to be emblematic of Boris Johnson's project, rewriting the electoral map and going back to what you said earlier about the way he was supposed to be uh, capturing left-wing economics in order to appeal to this new demographic, but kind of rewrite the way that politics was working. And I actually thought that was very clever. Like the uh, 2019 manifesto for the Tories was... A particularly good one, first of all, because Get Brexit Done was so appealing to pretty much everyone who is sick of having the Brexit rouse on their screens every evening, but also levelling up spoke to something that people were really feeling around the country as a result of austerity, but also, you know, the uh, implications of the Brexit vote and what it meant for spotlighting areas that had otherwise been left out of the media and political narrative. No, I completely agree. And, and you know, Boris Johnson, I, I mean, he has just earned a million pounds from four speaking engagements, so maybe he's not that depressed. But in his darker moments, he must think back on, on what he squandered. Because as you say, he'd, he'd stumbled, um, whether by accident or design, upon some great themes. Yeah. Um, Which Labour are now parroting? I mean, how many Labour MPs do you speak to now who use the language of levelling up? They weren't really supposed to use the phrase because it was giving, you know giving airtime to a Tory policy, but actually they, they've taken it and run with it, which which is a sort of agenda-defining thing, if you can make that happen. Yeah, can you ever? I mean, we, we should do a whole podcast about that. But mm. the very next day after Wakeford crosses the floor, Will Rag, uh, who I'd actually seen the previous night and he'd sort of spoken to me a little about this, and I hadn't really, <laughs> being a great journalist, <laughs> taken in the import of it all, gets up the next morning on Sky News, or rather from his committee chairmanship uh, and is reported on Sky News. So he saying, was chair of the Public Administration Committee. Thank you, Anoush. He, he gets up and says there's um, blackmail going on. The whips are blackmailing MPs to try and keep them in line. And, you know, MPs should refer themselves to the police if, if they feel blackmailed, which is, uh, I, I mean, lots of veteran journalists at the time sort of said this is a storm in the teacup, you know. We all know this happens. But Rag was the first one to kind of get up and publicly say it. And again, it just it contributed to that sense that the discipline was breaking down mm. and the MPs realised they were powerful. And what he meant about blackmail was that the whips were saying, oh, you know that new school we were going to build in your constituency? Well, that's not looking so likely now if you if you put a letter of no confidence in against Boris Johnson, right? And again, he was he was flagging something that would become a bigger theme over the course of the year in the sense that Chris Pincher was the deputy chief whip. Yeah. And, you know, we, we later heard all the sorts of things that he was doing to yes. blackmail people. Yeah. Which I won't repeat for risk of libel. But <laughs> so I think, you know, right at the start of the, the year, all the themes that you're going to see play out um, pop up. And then again, just four days later, I, I, at the time living through it, I didn't realize quite how extraordinary this was. 
Four days later, Nuskani gets up and says... Oh, yeah. She accused Mark Spencer of basically saying, you know, people are uncomfortable with you as a Muslim in the position that you're right. in. Right. Which was extraordinary. But in, in a way, because that was... It was almost in hyper time that time that it was a news story, I think, in the Sunday papers. And it just, you know, the the, the news bus moved on. But Completely. And the same day, there was another news yeah. story, which is uh, Lord Agnew, the, um, the sort of uh, lordly appointment in the cabinet office and the treasury resigned criticizing Rishi Sunak for failing to take fraud seriously during the COVID pandemic. Yeah, which was another theme pandemic. That, that would then play out for the rest of the year. Yeah, exactly. And Kemi Badenoch during her leadership would sort of cite Agnew in order to undermine Sunak. And then just the next day, the Met announces its investigation into Partygate, yeah. which really puts the skids on, on that whole um, movement and sort of delays us for two months, whether good or bad. Yeah. Six days later, Sue Gray comes out with her initial findings. 48 hours after that, <laughs> the leveling up white paper comes out and it's clear that Michael goes furious that there's not enough money yep. for it. 24 hours after that, Manura Mi Mirza resigns and Johnson <laughs> clears out number 10. So just in that three week period, and especially in that last 10 days, I mean, it became incredibly febrile. I mean, in a way, looking back at it, it was a sign of Boris Johnson's staying power, wasn't it? Because every time one of these things happened that you've just listed there, people would say, this is it for Johnson. This is it. I mean, I'm sure we must have said it a few times on the podcast mm -hmm. at the time. But he stuck around, didn't he? And, and that just shows, like you said, it was a febrile atmosphere in the party. But that was because the part that was partly because the party couldn't get its act together. Remember the Brexit rebels, they were so organized. You know, you knew who to call if you wanted to know what rebellion on X amendment was about mm -hmm. back in that time. This time it was like, which of the rebels are you speaking to and what, what are they rebelling for? You know, I know I remember running a piece at the time saying it's a leaderless plot. So you yeah, don't know who exactly, yeah. you know, who, who's going to pop up next. But I think that actually made it more damaging for Johnson in the long term. And, you know, while it was all delayed and difficult at the time, like it was extremely corrosive and the fact that it was a grassroots thing where, you know, David Davis, for instance, would just pop up and say, in the name of God, go, I decided this morning <laughs> yeah. on the way to the commons that it's time for you to leave. And then the next day, Tobias Elwood would midway through a Sky News interview say, yeah, you know, by the way, Boris Johnson should leave. <laughs> yeah. It's like that made it uncontrollable, I think, for number yeah, 10. It did. And actually, I think talking about how themes have played out later on in the year, I think that sort of dis disintegrated nature of the rebellion really did for Boris Johnson when he tried to do that comeback, you know, when he tried to run as leader after the collapse of Liz Truss's government as well, because there there is no Johnsonite wing, really. OK, you do have a few of the loyalists who stick around and say the things in support. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or the shadow whipping operation or whatever they called it around the time that we're talking about. Um, but there just isn't that contingent there that would row in behind him. And I think that's kind of what he was hoping for when he came back from his Caribbean holiday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was great when he failed. But in, in our in our timeline, he's still just hanging on in February. Yeah. And then three weeks after Mirza resigns, Russia, Russia. invades Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah. yeah, which again is another, uh, you know, Putin helping Johnson out. No, I mean seriously, it, it, it was it was a strange event because, in many ways, I don't think it changed politics very much. You know, there was a cross party consensus on Ukraine very quickly. Really? I think it changed politics completely. Okay, please. Because what I remember is from that time when Russia invaded Ukraine, all of these people, I think, you know, who had been suddenly coming out in TV interviews and saying Boris Johnson mm -hmm. resigned, were suddenly saying, well, actually, now it's not the right time. No, right. no, no, no. Well, we've got to row behind the prime minister when there's war on our doorstep. You know, Douglas Ross being, a, being an example mm -hmm. of one of those flip-floppers. And I think that really did change politics because it shored up Boris Johnson's position, which probably laid the groundwork for him constantly going to visit Zelensky in the, uh, in the safe Tory seat of Kiev. <laughs> Kiev Central. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe that's where you can go after he loses Uxbridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it will be a blue wall seat by then, though. You're, abs yeah. You're absolutely right that, of course, it, it changed politics at the time. I guess, in hindsight, was it doing anything more than, than delaying mm. him? And, like, could it ever have been anything more than a delay? Because you had Grey still to come, and because you had so many people who were still aggrieved, I don't know. I mean... W it didn't save him in the end, right? No, it didn't in the end, but it did really delay, which, and I think the delay of that affected what happened afterwards. So it allowed sort of Rishi Sunak to fall from grace, which meant that he didn't, That's a very good point. you know, that he didn't come first in the next Tory leadership contest. Mm -hmm. 
which, you know, I mean, I suppose we're talking in hypotheticals here, but Liz Truss's premiership is probably one of the most instrumental things in the Conservative Party's reputation yeah. come the next election. It's going to be the thing that people remember. So I think in a way... <laughs> You know, in the way you know that phrase, justice delayed is justice denied. I feel like Boris Johnson's <laughs> resignation delayed really denied, you know, something for the party in terms of uh, clinging onto its reputation. Yeah, and in terms of a clean shift from yes. uh, Johnson to Sunak. Yeah. Before the chaos. You're exactly, right. Exactly. Yeah. Because Sunak is so far ahead in in the you know, opinion polls and and internally in the party in January that if they do get rid of Johnson, then. And of course, if Sunak had the uh, chutzpah to have got up and said we should get rid of him, yeah. then, yeah, I think it's very likely he probably does beat Truss even with the members. And I think you're right that, you know, going back to that 2012 question, why is it if Sunak and Starmer are very similar to Miliband and Cameron, why is it that Sunak's 20 points behind? We both know the answer is because of Liz Truss. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm not actually sure that in two years' time they're still going to be voting on Liz Truss. I mean, that's why I don't think they're right. 20 points ahead. I think this is this is the jilted uh, party membership who are currently saying, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. You know, I'm annoyed by what's happened. So maybe that will shift, but that's sort of getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so we, we, we're, on to the, we're on to the Russian invasion of Ukraine with all of the problems that that brought, one of which also played out in themes to come, which was the sheer incompetence of the Home Office. Um, and so you had these refugee... Uh, responses that were just so lacking. I mean, do you remember that minister? I can't remember even their name, but they were on the news and saying, well, actually, they can come through on the fruit pickers scheme and just getting absolutely um, torn apart for that. And I think that laid the groundwork for, you know, the failures of, or, or at least it, it shone a light on the failures of this department in terms of um, small boats crossings and mm -hmm. uh, treatment of asylum seekers, the backlogs, the sheer backlogs. I mean, it's not just about asylum uh, application processing. It's also about visa renewal processing, which means that people who do have a right to the, to work in the UK actually or, or just are dropping out of their everyone. jobs. Yeah, and passports for everyone, exactly. Yeah. Which is sort of some of some of our main sort of uh, use of the Home Office. If you're a sort of ordinary mainstream citizen, is is that? And I think it shone a light on that, and also the um, successive incompetence of the Home Secretaries that have been appointed over this year. Yeah, and just this was the year we realized that Britain wasn't working. I mean, lots of people would, in the mainstream sense, I mean, lots of people knew that and yeah. have known it for a long time. And people have had to experience public services in, in, in more deprived areas and everything else. But this is the year it became sort of fashionable conversation. Yes. To yeah. say Britain isn't working. Yes. And actually, that's apparently that's coming up as a word in a lot of the focus groups that are happening now. Shambles. Right. Shambles Britain, shambolic Britain. It's an omni shambles, just like in 2012. Yeah, exactly. That was that was when that phrase came about, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that budget. But so it's just great call back there, <laughs> <laughs> made for radio. So just uh, a few weeks, a month after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Sunak makes his spring statement, and I, yeah, I'd yeah. actually been at his May's lecture just oh, yeah. when the Russians invaded, and he did this. He does this like little insert at the start of his speech where he says, you know. It's all terrible, but uh, let's talk about economics. And then gives a very, <laughs> a very bland. I, I, I'd say quite um, concerning if I was a true party strategist uh, explanation of how the economy grows. Right. That doesn't really, for me, give me any sense that he he has anything he really wants to say. So for me, like it's quite clear early in the year that Rishi Sunak isn't going to be the clear answer to their problems. And then when he gives his spring statement, I was in the chamber, I was in the gallery watching it live. And it is amazing how monotonous and robotic his delivery was then and can be. And, you know, he just sort of metronomically looked to the right, looked to the looked to his um, dispatch box, looked to the left as he gave his speech. And you didn't really feel like the party was behind him. And uh, the statement soon sort of unraveled. Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I call this his mini budget moment. I think people have forgotten about it. But the spring statement was really significant because it just had nothing in it mm -hmm. for the most vulnerable. You know, this was coming in amid people's concerns about energy prices rising in a cost of living crisis. And there really was very little in there. Um, the help with energy was just a loan, wasn't it, at that time? And he had to come back less than two months later, I think, to introduced the windfall tax and the proper energy support package, which actually went down far better. But, you yeah. know, it shows his political right. naivety, I think. Completely. I think you're right. And, and also he got so much less credit for coming out with those. Yeah, because it was Labour's fact. policy. Yeah. yeah. And I, one other detail that I remember then, talk about there being so little in that uh, statement, 
One thing that was in it was a massive fuel duty cut. And I remember sitting next to a Sun journalist who turned and looked to the government spokesman who hmm. were part of the gallery and sort of gave him a uh, like congratulatory uh, sign. Mm. And you just thought, wow, okay, so this is how government policy works. Like the Sun and Number 10, you know, Agree. Cut fuel duty. Yeah, cut fuel duty. <laughs> that is okay. literally since 2012. If we had to choose one thing that's happened yeah. every year, exactly. It's basically right. that either they freeze cut or cut, cut yeah. fuel duty. I think, duty. and I worked out we've lost about 20 billion in foregone revenue from cutting fuel duty. So, yeah, it's a terrible policy. Anyway. Yeah, and actually, you know, I mean, his his woes didn't stop there because soon after you had the non-dom tax scandal around his wife. It turned out that she'd not been paying tax on her international earnings in the UK. Yeah, and who leaked that? Come I mean, on, Harry, <laughs> reveal it for us. You're not in the lobby anymore. You can you can uh, tell us your sources. Well, a couple of weeks later, I did write a piece uh, in mid-April saying Johnson's at war with Sunak and it's not clear he knows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were a whole... We were, I think, were, were pretty early in the uh, in, in laying out all the ways that Johnson was delighting in Sunak's misfortune. And there's a lot of suspicion that he was... His, yeah. his number 10 team were behind that leak. Yeah. And, you know, he and Nadine Dorries were at checkers together, sort of delighting in, in the... the the way things had worked out for Sunak and Crosby, we were reported at the time, you know, thought Sunak was the wrong guy to be chancellor during cost of living crisis and wanted him out. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when you really started to realize that these two people couldn't work together anymore. And that Sunak, well, he started to feel like a lame duck, actually, because you thought you haven't gone in time. Johnson now can get rid of you whenever he wants. Yeah, it felt like he'd bottled it in that moment, hadn't it? Because we did hear later on that he had been toying with resigning. Uh, during the initial party gate revelations. Yeah, that's what they briefed out, which yeah. was crazy to do. Yeah, yeah. Like, resign or don't resign. Yeah, exactly. Don't and say to, you might have. And to tell people that you didn't have the backbone or that you are an indecisive person mm -hmm. is is <laughs> know, not very reassuring. Who's had more of a yo-yo year? I mean, there's like Sunak, Starmer, Johnson. All their reputations just kept going up and down throughout the year, right? Yeah, yeah, it, they did. Absolutely. And Sunak, probably more than any Anyone of the else? others. Because yeah. at this time, and I hope I'm not embarrassing him by saying this, but our political editor, Andrew Marr, was mm -hmm. like, this is, you know, this is the moment where Rishi Sunak's hopes of being prime minister... You know, have been dashed. Have, do, have been dashed. Yeah, and and actually, you know, I think a lot of people felt that at the, at the time because of his handling of the spring statement, because of the way that he'd fallen out with Johnson, but also because of the way that he handled the tax scandal as well. You know, first of all, you know, it, it took ages to get a proper statement from him, and then you know, okay, she's not going to have the non-dom status anymore, but we're not saying that it's a bad thing to have. You know, it was just very confusing. Very much a politician who wasn't able to ride out a scandal in the way that Johnson would be able to. And to be fair to Mark, that is sort of what plays out later in the summer when they yeah. have the leadership contest. I yeah. Mean, he is damaged at, crucially at this time. That's exactly. why Liz Truss gets in. Yeah. Another thing to remind you of, late April, just a couple of weeks later, we have reports of porn being watched in the house, mm. which allows both me and Patrick McGuire to sound our, our <laughs> plea, which is ban phones in the House of Commons. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. No one's paying any attention because they're all on their phones. Does this include the press gallery as well? I wouldn't be against that. I wouldn't be against that. I just think, look, if you go back and read Badger, it says MPs shouldn't even read out speeches. They should only be reading like notes from an aid memoir as an aid memoir. So they should really be taking part in sort of spontaneous debate, listening yeah. to one another. This is the whole point of the House. It's going to be the great debating chamber. Rather than coming and reading out pre-approved lines. Right. So, yeah. so now what happens is they have verbatim speeches they read out. Yeah. No one enforces that. And they all are on their phones. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what are we doing here? Are we are we trying to maintain some sort of standard of debate or not? I mean, it's also terrible that porn is being watched in the House, but this is a broader point I want to make. <laughs> yeah, and actually it's an important point because it does, um, I mean, this porn story does tell a story of, uh, about the culture in the Commons that actually turned out to be part of Boris Johnson's downfall, really, with the Chris Pincher revelations and the way that they tried to cover them up. It told a wider story about the way that MPs and staff, well, MPs feel like they can behave around each other, but also their staff. And that's been a big, big problem for, for Boris Johnson, and it ties into the sleaze allegations as well. I mean, we talked about uh, Tory polling falling off a cliff during the Partygate scandal, but actually the time where it really started to, to decline was the Owen Paterson mm -hmm. scandal, mm -hmm. um, which was when people really felt, oh, they're only after themselves and they're trying to sort of game the system for, for each other to protect each other. And that has been the story of, you know, COVID contracts, the Michelle Moan scandal, um, you know, some of the stuff about behaviour, you know, they're all like trying to 
protect each other and have each other's backs. That was a story of Tory sleeves. Obviously, it affects the reputation of all politicians. So it's difficult for Labour to attack the Tories on that all the time. You just made me realise that I think someone said this before, but they're all P's, right? So it's Owen Patterson, Partygate, Parish, yeah, Pincher, <laughs> Procurement. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. the year of, of the year. That's of what they teach MPs actually. The the five P's before yeah, they right? get into Parliament. <laughs> Here's not what to do. Yeah. Here's what not to do. Uh, and then just a week after that, you have the local elections. Tory lose 485 oh, yes. seats. I know, yeah. I forgot about it too, but I went back. Yeah. So they lose 485 seats, including Westminster, Wandsworth and Barnet in London, which are all sort of totemic to Tory councils. Yes. And that does sort of revive the mood a little bit. And and look, we're now, we're now only a month away from the confidence vote. So With those totemic London councils falling, but also... Uh, other things happening you know you had um labor gaining council seats from the conservatives in some of these sort of true blue enclaves in the in the um i don't know whitney chipping norton uh, the lib dems surged ahead in tunbridge wells so you know you could you could see that these tory heartlands were being chipped away at um and actually from the a very recent Savanta poll coming back to the present you have the tories just on 69 seats losing most of their mps in the north and most of them in london as well and Blue Wall Falls, which they're calling them now, like Boris Johnson and Dominic Raab, Dominic Raab's seat in um, in Surrey. And there's also been polling suggest Jacob Rees-Mogg could lose his seat in Somerset. Jeremy Hunt could be ousted in Surrey. So this is, I think, with the local elections, that is the moment where the Blue Wall narrative, I think, really takes takes hold. Because obviously you had the Chesham and Amersham by-election. Um, but that fe- felt like, oh, you know, maybe that was just a sort of one off people, people mm-hmm. annoyed with the government. But the, I think the, the results of these local elections really did cement the blue wall narrative. I know our polling expert, Ben Walker, hates the phrase because blue wall can mean all sorts of different yeah. types of seats. But I think that's what really affected the behaviour of some ho- high profile politicians in the Conservative Party. Like Jeremy Hunt, for example, when I interviewed him, this was when he was sort of saying privately that he was going to run for leader, but not publicly yet. Um, he was saying we really need to focus on the Tory heartlands, um, you know, the suburban and commuter belt seats and started worrying about, you know, Boris Johnson's obsession with the Red Wall. I think I think that's right. And I think local elections in 2019 were also hugely important in getting mm. rid of May. So local elections exactly. can be, yeah, they yeah. can be this great spur for the party to act. And uh, over the course of the next month, we're really building towards the Sue Gray report. Yeah. which is going to come out on the 25th of May. So three weeks after the local elections. So I think, again, like the local elections at the time were sort of endurable, but they were, in the light of the full Sue Gray report, which was about to come out, you know, part of the narrative that was building. Yeah. But just before we talk about Johnson's failure, or, or rather the confidence vote he is about to endure, you've got Starmer saying, I'll go on Beergate. The thing I'd say about Beergate is it really is a Tory plot. I mean, the... the <laughs> The conservative research department are the ones that sort of put that out there. Yes, yes. And, They've and got a very good attacking unit there, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. And at the time I was reporting it like this is bad for Starmer. And I think it is because it just, for me, it showed that Starmer is just, he, he never looks at ease under pressure. He does handle the story, I think, it, it, overall quite well. But even then, he, he just seemed a little shifty. Just, I, I, I don't I don't find him a fully convincing politician. And I, and I, I think he will struggle in an election. I mean, he's fortunate to go up against an, another robot, but I think he's going to... The big difference between Major and Blair in the 90s and like Starmer and Sunak now, because people like to compare this to the late yes. 90s and they say, you know, Labour's coming back in. Ma- Major's, or worry that it's 92. Or worry it's 92. <laughs> well, well, maybe that is why it's a good comparison. Like, Starmer's nothing like Blair. I mean, he really isn't. And you look at the polling data, I think something like 20% of people think Keir Starmer's charismatic. So... I think it's just salutary to rem- to remember that Labour Party might feel like they're way ahead here, but they they don't have a, have a leader that's really resonating with the public, just one that isn't alienating the public. I think that's true, and I think because we watch him day in day out, there is the danger of groupthink among mm-hmm. the sort of Westminster commentariat because each week when he does a you know a PMQs where he lands a few blows, people say, "Oh, he's got really good at this. He's got the confidence. He's got the experience." <laughs> Actually, I I don't. He's not a he's not a good performer. No, right? I think we can say that. Um, I remember speaking to Peter Mandelson. I interviewed him after Labour lost Hartlepool, another by-election to mention. About 18 months ago, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was saying, well, you know, we were talking about the comparisons to Blair and things, and I was saying, well, you know, I think he reminds me more of 
Ed Miliband than Tony Blair. And Peter Mandelson, you might say that I couldn't possibly comment, which <laughs> suggested to me that even though Mandelson, who has been someone who's been helping the Starmer operation, mm -hmm. kind of to some extent agreed that he's not sort of the slickest performer. I agree with you. He looks uncomfortable under pressure. And Blair wanted to use Beer Gate as a time to discuss his journey through the year. You were talking about people yo-yoing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he's probably, if you looked at the trajectory, he's probably had quite a good year, really. Yeah, definitely. And just the way, uh, so much of this stuff is just the way people treat you and the way that the group starts to feel about you, right? Yeah. Um, there's no real reason why, you know, you're up or down, but Keir Starmer's now up. And so everyone sort of treats him with a bit more... Uh, a feeling of um, of brilliance, but um, I think at this point, you know, he is just in that very difficult stage of opposition where you still don't know when the next election is going to be. You are unwilling to really come out with any policy, and so he is frustrating, and he's frustrating in the way that the Miliband was again in 2012. Um, Miliband would always talk about the way he wanted to change capitalism change the economy without ever being very specific about it but mm -hmm. the problem is you can't really be specific about anything in opposition two years before an election yeah and one thing that i think is beyond his control is the dilemma of a leader of opposition which is people will often level the criticism at him when i sit in on focus groups or i go out and interview people sort of around the country who are less you know plugged into politics day to day they will say well every time i see him he's criticizing the government what would he do instead and you know that is the job of the leader of the opposition and he did kind of suspend those kind of rivalries during the pandemic and tried to be a sort of constructive critic mm -hmm. um but you know now it's it's more politics as usual and people don't like the idea that they're constantly seeing someone criticizing but never suggesting something himself but at pmqs that is his job yeah i mean i would suggest more but uh, more smart. criticism no i would suggest more alternative vision of how you want the world to be yeah but smart opposition strategists say that you should never do that mm. i think one thing to say is rob ford who uh has just started a Substack called swingometer who's great um, and I often turn to for thoughts on this stuff. He, he, he pointed out that between 2010 and 2017, uh, half the electorate changed party between yeah. the elections. So there's so much that's still up for grabs. I think something like a third of the, third of the electorate doesn't know who they'd vote for or says currently they wouldn't vote at the next election. So, mm -hmm. you know, these things we're talking about with Starmer, the reason why I think they're all relevant is so much the public won't have made up their mind at the time of the next yeah. general election. And there are so many of them are swing voters now. Yeah. That it could all turn on how he performs in the weeks leading up to the campaign, just like with Corbyn and May. Uh, they were pretty unknown in 2017. I think Sunak and Starmer, I mean, neither of them have fought a general election campaign. So I think there's a lot of scope for things to change in the weeks Definitely. building up to the campaign. That's really interesting because I think in some of the polling that we did with Redfield and Wilton, I think around the time of Labour conference this year, I think it was about a third of voters who didn't know, said they didn't know much about Keir Starmer as well. Right. So there's a lot for them to make up their minds about, about the man himself as well. And I think you're right. You know, we are, I mean, Ben Walker puts it, we're a nation of swingers, <laughs> um, which makes it sound a little bit more saucy than it perhaps is. But yeah, people, you know, like people, shop around since the financial crash people have been shopping around rather than staying loyal to one supermarket Completely. people are not loyal to one particular political party anymore i actually make up every election i decide who to vote for in the ballot box and i don't feel Do like you? i've ever known before then okay well that you're probably more of a typical voter then yeah yeah I think so. Yeah. I'm also trying to pay less and less attention to politics so I can become even more like a typical voter. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to have dragged you onto this I'm not podcast. sure I'll be able to hold on to my job for that long. But, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to reflect the medium voter here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, just to whiz through the, the summer quickly so we can yes. get onto the, the many other prime ministers we had. Uh, <laughs> you have in late May the full Sue Gray report. Just yeah. around that time you have Liz Truss, then Foreign Secretary, come out and say I'm going to unilaterally rewrite or we are going to unilaterally rewrite the Northern Ireland Protocol yeah. which obviously also stokes up a lot of division and frustration in the Tory party and then after the Diamond Jubilee you have the confidence vote on the 6th of June yeah, which is an extraordinary uh, 24 hours I mean I was actually told um, by a source the night before that the vote was going to happen but I was sort of told in a way that I couldn't report it so I didn't uh, again boy. proving myself to be a brilliant <laughs> journalist uh, I hope my editor's not listening. And <laughs> then the day of the vote was just extraordinary in Westminster. And um, it was 148 against in the end. 
which was just around the number that had voted against Thatcher in 1990. And she yeah. was gone. I think she announced her re- resignation within 48 hours or yeah. 72 hours. And we thought Johnson, you know, may have to do that. And instead he tries to cling on. And it always seemed, given the Thatcher parallel, that that was going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah, no, I remember that. And I actually think that I was on a beach in Sicily at the time. <laughs> I was in Italy for, you in Sicily for, for it. my friend's wedding. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't here for it. Uh, feeling very guilty, but also... Not that guilty. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, so I was reading the coverage just as an ordinary punter. And I remember thinking, you know, because of the Thatcher comparisons, it just couldn't, he just couldn't cling on. Um, but he did. And, you know. For a month. Yeah, for a month. But he was there, you know. But until Chris Pincher, the news around Pincher comes out on the 30th of June, so about three and a half weeks later. Until that point, it felt like he was going to stick around. Yeah. No, it did. And, and, I, I and think without Pincher, he probably could have got through the summer exactly. and he probably still would be PM. Exactly, exactly. And I think this is what's really interesting. It's the thing that brought Boris Johnson down ultimately wasn't really the success of the rebels, was it? it was or, or Partygate. No, or Partygate even. It was a Westminster... Sleaze scandal. Sleaze scandal. And that says so much about um, you know what's actually been shaping our politics in this time. I suppose you could tie Partygate into Sleaze in a way that it's of sort course. of like one rule for us. I think the whole idea of Sleaze is it's one full rule for us and another for either the public or our staff or whoever we're mistreating. And it's accumulative, of course. Yeah, yeah. And then that really is sort of power corrupting, isn't it? So I suppose it is all part of the same story. But I think what is most interesting about that is that he, Boris Johnson, the kind of leader that he was, had almost dismissed those kind of stories as not relevant to his power or... Um, you know, the way that he was running his party or the country. And it was sort of snuck up on him, really. Mm-hmm. I think he thought that he could get away with kind of, you know. With, with the Chris Pincher story, just yeah. like he did with the Owen Patterson exactly, story. equivocating a bit on how much he knew and just, just hoping it would go away. Yeah, I mean, he learned nothing. The man, mm-hmm. that is the, he's the man who learns nothing. Yeah, yeah. He like, he learned the, the, the way to win power at an early age, but not how to hold on to it seemingly. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. as one of my friends who, who's also a journalist said said at the time, it's ironic that it was a sex scandal not involving Boris Johnson that brought right. down Boris Johnson. Right. <laughs> and so you have Pincher on the, the Thursday, I think the news comes out. And then I remember the Tuesday, 5th of July, um, when Sunak and Sajid, or rather Sajid and Sunak, because Sajid does it first, both resign yeah. at about 6 p.m. And again, I was tipped off that <laughs> that was going to happen. About 10 minutes before it happened. But I didn't... <laughs> I didn't have the ability to report You'd it. You banned having a phone in the chamber, <laughs> so you couldn't you couldn't tweet it. No, so Sajid and Sunak come out, and and and, and that's the moment where everything goes haywire. And we rapidly are rewriting the new statesman because some listeners will not know, but that's about two hours before our print deadline. Yes, so I was in the office that that afternoon when the news broke. You know, people were pretty much thinking we had the issue wrapped up. And then I just saw all of our sub-editors' faces fall at the news. Um, So we did have to do a very, very quick rewrite. Um, They don't don't like getting copy on a Monday, let alone Tuesday evening. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, any ministers who want to ruin the new statesman issue that week, Tuesday night is the time to do it. Absolutely. (laughs) Just before, though. Not too late. Tuesday night before seven. Yeah. (laughs) And... The next day, we have the liaison committee, and and that's the day that Johnson really falls. I mean, he doesn't actually resign until the next morning, but that's the day where you feel it in in Port Carlos House. I remember speaking to uh, the Times' political editor, Stephen Swinford, mm. at about lunchtime, and I never met Stephen, but I was just speaking to him, and I said, you know, how do you feel? Like, what's happening today? And he said, just look around. It's over. You can feel it. Right. And I was like, okay, well, if you know that. Yeah, like a seasoned lobby yeah, journalist yeah. who's covered these kind of scandals before. And then two yeah. hours later, we have the liaison committee at 3.30 and, and Freddie Hayward, the great Freddie Hayward, uh, who continues the lobby beat for the New Statesman, encouraged me to, to come and watch it with him. And I'm so grateful he did because we ended up being just about two of 10 journalists who were in the room. Mm. And my God, Johnson turns up a little late. We, we're wondering whether he's going to turn up at all. He is blissfully without a phone because he's paying attention. And so over the next hour and a half, everyone else in the room has a phone. The MPs have phones. We have phones, the journalists, the public, the small gathering of the public behind him has phones. And so an hour into the liaison committee, we get reports that Zahawi has joined the rebels and they're all going to number 10 to tell Johnson as soon as he comes back from the liaison committee that it's over. But Johnson doesn't know. 
Yeah. So he's sitting there answering questions and everyone in the room has about this <laughs> 10 minute window where we know it's over for him and he doesn't know. He's the one person in Westminster who doesn't know. Yeah, because he's following my phone In the role. country. Good man. <laughs> so that was, that's the moment I'll never really forget. And then I keep looking at him just thinking, when is he going to get past the note? When is he going to get past the note? And finally he gets past the note. And, and I see a sort of face fall and his hand like go to his face. And he stumbles over the next question. I can just, I'm like, that's it. He knows. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, it is brutal because the, the liaison committee is difficult in the best of times, isn't it? Because it's all the different select committee chairs asking you questions about Everything. any number, like no recourse to public funds, sewage, and, and there like are, anything. It's rebel up. central it in is. there because it's like Elwood, Rag, <laughs> Rag um, Tugendha, you know, all of them. Yeah. yeah it's amazing. And then later that night, I'm on the Commons Terrace. I, I, where are you for this? And he sacks Michael Gove. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I don't. Where was I when he sacked Michael Gove? I can't yeah. actually remember. Yeah, I, I think I was moment. in the office. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a, it's like end of term feeling on the yeah. Commons Terrace. People are drinking. It's like you've kind of forgotten what the time is. And suddenly we get reports that Johnson's thrown Gove out. And it's like this is this is the fall of Rome here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was the moment where, you know, <laughs> totally bizarrely, because all of these ministers were resigning around him and he decided to t take the opportunity to sack one of his ministers, making it even less likely that he could ever recruit a new cabinet. And this is this is the end of a 36 year story between the two of them. Yeah. It goes back to Oxford. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The great really? rivalry. Yeah. So mm. it's fascinating. Yeah. And then the next day he's out. The next day he, he resigns early in the morning. Yeah, and this was when no one had heard from Downing Street for a while. Mm -hmm. And you had Chris Mason on the Today programme kind of trying to sort of flannel through yet another, well, we don't quite know what's going to happen next, but, you know, the 50 ministers have resigned and then suddenly he got, the, you could hear his phone ringing on the interview and he was like, I'm just going to answer this. Um, and that's when we knew that Boris Johnson was going to stand down. But then this sort of whole almost conspiracy cons conspiracy adjacent story erupted that he wasn't actually going to go because he wasn't standing down in, with immediate effect. He was yeah. going to cling on over the summer or at least until a um, leadership campaign. Well, he does give this remarkable statement where he never resigns. Yeah, and everyone it felt Trumpian. Everyone treats <laughs> it like he said he's resigned, but he hadn't. And, and he sort of smartly got ahead of things and uh, avoided being thrown out. Yeah. And I think that that did sort of help him potentially try and come back. And and the party would potentially have been wiser to, you know, have held that second vote and got rid of him and shown how much they didn't want him. But in the end, it didn't matter because he, he never made a comeback. Yeah. And and let's not forget, this is the time where certain ministers um, took cabinet positions for all of five minutes and then... Right. <laughs> Everyone was bumping again. up their post-political speaking engagement Yeah, fee. yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was very unedifying for everyone involved, <laughs> I think. And you had the kind of politicians filling in over the summer in cabinet roles. Steve Barclay, who is now health secretary again, is, is, is one of them. But yeah, they were kind of standing in for these roles, but not really sure of anything that they could do. Right. Which was kind of a betrayal of the British public, considering what we were supposed to be preparing for this winter. And uh, an hour into this podcast, we're only halfway through the year. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the leadership race. No, leadership it's been a great year. Yeah. It's been a great year. <laughs> so far. And I, so feel, far, like, so I feel like Johnson should take up most of it because he's like the main act and then we get the kind of chaos that, that unfolds next yes and like we've said he was the catalyst for some of the chaos that was here yeah now. yeah so yes tory leadership race i thought that was really interesting because some of the we, we really learned what what the tory membership wanted and it was none of the people who have won since liz truss and rishi sunak i mean he didn't win but you know mm -hmm. didn't win the membership but he, he he became prime minister in the end um but yeah they liked penny morden um, someone who has held ministerial roles but was seen as more of a fresh face whose politics isn't particularly well known he doesn't have a particularly strong politics and Kemi Badenoch mm -hmm. who I think I think the reason that members like her yes she's a bit more to the right but she actually sounds like a human being Completely. and I think people people like that about her and I think she is an impressive performer um, and then you had Suella Braverman as well didn't you who was popular as, as well I think it's a credit to Kemi Radnock that she sounds so reasonable given that what she's saying is often pretty out there I mean yeah. she sort of wants to slash the state yeah um, far more than George Osborne ever did but I agree that when you heard her on the debate stage yeah she sounded like someone you could throw a question to who would be able to answer it and sound competent which is a pretty high bar for the Tory party and certainly more impressive than Liz Truss who you know I was short Liz Truss as they say in finance the entire time, <laughs> I want to say. I mean, I thought she was terrible in the debates. I thought she was terrible when she won. 
thought she wasn't going to survive and she didn't. And I couldn't understand why the Tory party weren't switching, the Tory right that is, weren't switching from trust to Kemi yeah. when it became clear that Kemi was very nearly you know, ahead of Truss, yeah. despite being essentially unknown and Truss being the foreign secretary. I thought that was a real red flag, the fact that they were so close yeah. and that the right should have jumped onto to Kemi uh, at that point. It was, yeah, it was such a mistake. And you could tell in that first debate, do you remember the first TV debate where Truss was extremely robotic and I think a lot of MPs on the right in the back benches who had kind of decided that she, she should be their candidate had been regretting their decision. She, she won 3% of the public. What, in that, in that really? first debate. Really? Just 3%? So, yeah. Wow. That's the stat I keep going on about. So there's five of them on stage. Yeah. They're afterwards are asked, the public are asked, who did best? You know, who did you like the most? 3% voted for Truss. And she's the one that becomes prime minister. Yeah. So no, no wonder it was a disaster. <laughs> and no wonder every time these kind of elections come around, Tory MPs will, will say, we just shouldn't have membership involvement in mm -hmm. them. Um, because it does throw up some quite weird results sometimes. And I think there was a lot of second guessing of the membership as well, who are actually... More, a more thoughtful bunch than perhaps the mainstream coverage would take them for. Like I, in that summer, I went around and spoke to a lot of them in mm -hmm. the key sort of um, in the big, so one of the biggest associations. And they they really weren't that, that excited about trust, but right. they couldn't have Sunak because he was seen as a sort of metropolitan liberal type. Right. It was less to do with stabbing Johnson in the back. It was more to do with his whole, like we like to say these days, vibe. Right, right, mm. yeah. Yeah. So Jason, our editor, wrote a piece about Miliband in 2014 saying his problem is not policy but tone. Mm -hmm. And he's sort of catching on to the vibe theory of politics ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's that's Keir's success is, again, it's not policy but tone. Like Keir's tone is right, even though I think we both think he's not a particularly credi credible performer. Like he sounds right. He sounds like he's in the right place, I think, to a lot of voters. And I think, you know, uh, you're right that that that. Sunak's tone didn't fit the, or his vibe didn't fit the Tory party. Yeah. And and so much of politics just is about that now. I mean, maybe it always was. Maybe we just finally found a phrase for it. Yeah, exactly. The vibe theory of politics. The vibe theory of everything. Our last bit of this whistle stop tour through this weird year. Has it, is... has it been a whistle stop tour? I think it's been quite a. Well, I mean, the listeners can can be the judge of that. What's the what's what's a longer whistle? I think it's trombone. Sort of le yeah, leisurely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Liz right, Truss's rise and fall, which yeah. luckily, thankfully, is very quick <laughs> for the purposes of this but podcast. I mean, not take... for free market fans. Yeah, it's enough to take me out of politics. So, right. you know, okay. I was one casualty of Liz Truss's premiership. Oh, really? Is that what? Well, I just couldn't cover her. <laughs> I was like, but she doesn't know anything. She doesn't know what she wants to do. <laughs> I can't take her seriously. Uh, yeah, I just I couldn't be in there. For that right okay that's ironic given apparently the issues with her on the front sold very well at the newsstand i hear from our colleagues in the subscriptions department no i know i know i know she was good copy but i i want to believe in politicians i want i want the sense that they have a mission you know it's mm. worth covering okay like i didn't believe in austerity at all in fact i you know greatly oppose it like everyone else at the new statesman but at least cameron and osborne had a project cummings and johnson had a project i mean that project was absolutely fascinating i thought it was so interesting Yes. Watching, you know, them and Gove and again they all go go back a long way and they all had a mission they wanted to level up the country. It was something worthwhile. Trust it's like she'd read a paper from the IEA and thought that was government. And like what was the there there was no depth there. And I just thought there was nothing worth covering really. Right, okay. Well I, I would disagree. I think she did have a project. I think that was the problem, wasn't it? These times call for pragmatism, as Rishi Sunak has tried to, to be. He's tried to be a pragmatist. He's doing he's delivering budgets and autumn statements and things that he doesn't really want to do. He doesn't want to raise mm -hmm. taxes, but every time he seems to be in a position of power, he has to raise taxes. Liz Truss, you know, she, she followed ideology rather than the need for pragmatism in this moment. I totally disagree with what she tried to do, but I thought it was a coherent political project uh, but i just want to push against that it's not coherent at all she didn't know anything about it she was asked yeah, on but that's air. different from it not being a coherent political project but it's not coherent if you can't explain it and she couldn't explain it she would often be asked you know who who supports your plan what economic uh, economists are you know are you, are you working in the vein of and she'd like be able to name one of them well let's not forget that was the same for the brexiteers as well you know they, they were often asked on air like you know 50 economists have written to the Times to say it will be a disaster. Who have you got? And they had that one guy, Jared Lyons or whoever. And, you know, they got their project through and it was it was a vision for the country. I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not defending. These no, things, I know you're not. I, you're saying it was, it was coherent was... enough to appeal to the British public to be passed. I, I differentiate between Brexit, which was a referendum, you know, almost a leaderless one. And 
someone being in, in government and having a project. I just think, look, if Liz Truss was able to explain why she was behind her plan and, you know, if she'd shown ev any evidence that she'd really studied people or, or other nations, academic studies, whatever it was, I just felt like what was so frustrating about Truss is you listen to her in an interview and you've thought, she can't give you more than 10 words. There's this famous clip in the West Wing, for those who love it, where Jeb Bartlett, the president, takes out the Republican candidate opposite him by saying, give me the next 10 words. You, you've you given me a 10-word answer in a debate as to why we should do something. Give me the next 10 words and give me the 10 words after that. Yeah. Can you actually explain what you think? Or have you just got a soundbite? And my frustration with trust is she just had the soundbite. I want to go for growth. We all do. You know, I want to cut taxes. Okay, fine. But can you actually explain this? And, and you know, do you believe in it? And I thought what was always intriguing about Cummings, why I spent a lot of time covering him is, that was someone who could write 20,000 words on what he wanted to do. Now, of course, it had some... And go back and change it when... <laughs> yeah, when it didn't <laughs> work out. To make it make himself look better. No, no, no. I, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not venerating the guy, but I just want things to be dealt with seriously. And, and you know, I want you to have a, a plan and a mission. And I, I felt like Liz Truss um, had just the appearance of one. I could see what they were trying to do because the economic consensus hasn't delivered for the country in the past decade to two decades I you know, know. Gr growth has been really really slow and because we don't tax wealth she yeah. got it precisely wrong yeah i'm not saying that her solution to it was correct no, but of course. the idea was we've got to do something different and quite radical which is what people who would argue for wealth taxes and that kind of view of the economy would argue as well and actually it's been interesting speaking to left-wing economics and people in the sort of new left think tank world because there is quite a lot of crossover with the kind of diagnosis of the problem is that between the two. Yeah. Well, okay, and actually there's too. been some concern because what's happened now and our, our colleague Will Dunn has written about this, what he calls the Davos consensus, or at least uh, one of his interviewees called the Davos consensus, which yeah, is now great. now you have Rishi Sunak uh, and Jeremy Hunt with this sort of Cameron like prescription for the country, which is precisely not what the lessons should have been from this past year, according to both Liz Truss and her uh, supporters and you know people on the sort of new left economic side of things yeah i she's got a lot of credit for this and i just i just don't agree i just like the idea that going for growth is a an ideology or a strategy or something worked out i mean it's a banality if you ask me but there you go there we go and well i mean <laughs> let's see whether or not rishi sunak's taking it in the opposite direction but i think you, what, will you, that, what that will bring yeah and i think you're, you're 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 neatly bringing us back to where we began which is that sunak is reviving the camera consensus yeah. and again like you know is that going to be enough i mean it was in 2015 but but maybe the pendulum has now swung and and sort of starmer and sunak are like replaying what happened in 2012 with Miliband and cameron but maybe the yes. the scene is different the field is different the mood in the country is different so even though they're quite similar to the characters in 2012 like the underlying reality has changed. Yeah. Like we were saying at the start of the podcast. So maybe that's why Labour really can get back in, even though they're sort of replaying the politics of 10 years ago. Yeah, I think that's the big question. My God, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. You've been listening to the New Statesman podcast with me, Anoush Shikelian, and my colleague, Harry Lambert.